What interests me, I, I'm an adult physician and have been for 45 years, and what interests me is the variation in health in, um, in adults, the ge geography, the sociology, the ethnicity in particular. And over the years I've become very aware of the maternal factors that influence adult health. And that's what I want to concentrate on, because so much of it revolves around vitamin D. Firstly, how important is vitamin D? Well, this is a study from the US, and on the left we have the quarter of the study group with the highest levels of vitamin D, above 32 nanograms per mil, and that's standardised on one. And as we go through the other three groups, we can see reducing levels of vitamin D in the blood, <clears throat> and we can see increasing mortality rates. <laughs> In blue, all causes. In green is cardiovascular disease. In yellow is cancer. And in pink is infectious diseases. And they're all increasing with, as a health risk, as a mortality risk, with reducing levels of vitamin D. And arguably the most important is all-cause mortality, as when we die, it's not of immense relevance to us what's written on the death certificate. <laughs> we can see that... In those with the lowest levels of vitamin D, the mortality risk is 80% higher than those with the, um, with the highest levels of vitamin D. This is staggering, and it must be important. The interesting thing is, at the moment of birth, so much is determined about our lives and health in the future. That's consolidated during the first year of life. And by the age, age, by the age of four, a child's adult health is determined, and personality also determined. Personality showing very well on this slide, I think <laughs> it's true to say. We're concerned about inheritance, how we pass health from one generation to the next, and indeed to try to improve it. And we're dealing with the various factors, first the genetic factors, and we know about genes. I'm not going to dwell on genes in, in this talk. Epigenetic factors, these are interesting, fairly newly defined. These are factors that influence gene activity. And vitamin D is very powerful in this group. We'll see again shortly. Non-genetic factors are also very important. And these also involve almost, almost entirely vitamin D. Here we see a number of non-genetic factors which we inherit from our patients. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a doctor, I can't get away from this. From our parents. <laughs> and these are the various factors which I'll run through, and all of them have a bearing on vitamin D. Firstly, money. We inherit money which enables us to take holidays in the sun. And we find that people with little money don't have very much in the way of vitamin D. They have very low levels. But having plenty of money coming from our parents enables us to take holidays in the sun, even winter holidays. <coughs> housing, the sort of housing we inherit from our pa parents. Uh, do we have gardens? Do we have sun opportunities? Well, this shows a housing of a community, an industrial community, in the Pennines. Um, this is adjacent to the Rochdale Canal um, on the Lancashire side. And here we see the housing that we might inherit if we're unfortunate. These are actually back-to-back -back houses. One house backs onto the other. And in the background, we can see double-decker houses. The lower house backs into the ground, into the hillside, and the upper house um, has an entry on the hillside, further up the hillside. I wouldn't be surprised if this housing community has now been demolished. I took this photograph perhaps 30 years ago. But this is the sort of housing that chance might lead us to inherit. On the other hand, we might inherit and be born into a house with a nice garden when we can obtain much more sun and vitamin D. And indeed, vitamin D levels are higher in people with gardens than those without gardens. This was research I undertook about 25 years ago. Place of residence, once again, we might find we're born into northwest Europe, northwest UK, or southern Europe. The latitude and altitude determine sunlight exposure and vitamin D. Once again, we might be born into the Pennines. We might be born into a rather different community in the south of France, 
where opportunities for vitamin D are much greater. Religion might have a bearing. We inherit religion. We are free to choose religion. We generally inherit it. And this has an influence on behaviour, modesty in clothing. We might think that religion has a negative effect on vitamin D and sun exposure. But this is an interesting study from the Midwest of the United States looking at the frequency of church attendance related to six-year mortality. And we can see that those who never go to church have three times the mortality risk at six years than those who go to church uh, more than twice a week. This is fascinating. I can't really explain it in terms of vitamin D. Here we can see a negative effect of religion on vitamin D. There's plenty of sun in Israel, but if we look at the young Jewish mothers, we can see that almost half of those of the orthodox persuasion are significantly deficient of vitamin D. Those who are non-orthodox, rather less. And that, vit that uh, vitamin D supplements, shown on the right, do have a beneficial effect. So religion has an influence. Ethnicity also. Once again, we might find out that ethnicity is the adaptation to the country in which you're born. But if you change countries, are you going to adapt to the new country? The bi biological and behavioural aspects of sun avoidance. And here we see them. We see people transplanted, as it were, from a hot country where protection of the sun is required to a cold country. And here we see Blackburn with its grey sky, not a lot of sun. And we see the girls uh, who are probably going to be very, very deficient in vitamin D by nature of their ethnic traditions. In contrast, we see Krakow in Poland where people are trying to maximise their sun exposure during the summer months or the spring months here. Education gives us a chance for life expectancy, greater income, greater housing, greater travel, etc. And almost certainly a more sun exposure and vitamin D. Hobbies will also have a, um, an inherited tradition. Uh, outdoor activities, walking, gardening, sports, etc., giving more vitamin D uh, via the sun. A study from the Netherlands looks at allotment gardening and health, comparing um, allotment holders in blue with their non-allotment holding neighbours in pink. And we can see that the allotment holders have a very positive view of health well-being and physical activity. The neighbours have a very negative view of these factors. There's nothing concerning survival in, this, in these statistics. But interesting all the same. Diet is also likely to be inherited, <coughs> with fish in particular. And I'll come back to this shortly, because it's very, we'll see the importance of it in a slide to come. But the traditional foods, of course, in this part of of the world in the northwest Europe, as we've heard, is um, oily fish and kippers. Well, if we eat oily fish three times a day, we can achieve a good level of vitamin D, but not many people do. Perhaps fish eating does, well, run in families in this country. Certainly internationally it does. We've got to be aware of inheriting vegetarian tendencies in this country unless we're going to get plenty of vitamin D. I think um, what we've heard about India uh, shows us that what we've got to do if girls are vegetarians is encourage them to play cricket and get plenty of sun. <laughs> One of the interesting things that we inherit is microorganisms from our mother in particular. We can read about it in Wuthering Heights, which I read on holiday recently, and there's some very good descriptions of the inheritance of tuberculosis running through families and bringing people to an early death. We inherit also hepatitis B virus, particularly in China. HIV, syphilis is effectively a thing of the past. Coronary heart disease, you might be surprised to see here that it's down under microorganisms. But coronary heart disease has run very powerfully in families in more than a genetic tendency. I'll divert for a moment to show you the epidemic of coronary heart disease, which is an epidemic of the late 20th, 20th century. It appeared from nowhere around about 1920, reached its peak in the 1960s, 1970s, and then it's dropped enormously since then. We can see the peak in this country was about 550 deaths per 100,000 per annum in 1970. 
dropping right down. If we look at 1990, we can see the deaths were down to about 90 per 100,000. And this was a government document of, 90, of 2004. It predicted the end of the epidemic of coronary heart disease in women by 2013 and in men by 2016. This is age adjusted. Some of the very elderly will still be having coronary heart disease uh, until that cohort ultimately dies. Now, extrapolations are all very good, but they don't always work out. But this one has done. And the addition of recent data shows that we're well on the way to the end of the epidemic. It's staggering to think that these are the numbers of people dying now compared to 550 per 100,000 just um, uh, 30 years ago. There's only one thing that can cause an epidemic like that that comes on and goes away quickly uh, uh, of that scale, and that is a microorganism as yet not clearly identified. But there's a big source of microorganisms in our, in, uh, in our intestine. And we also inherit a big opportunity for illness. In utero, we are 100% human. We are sterile. Uh, later, uh, as we become adults, and indeed after we're about um, the age of four, we are 90%, only 10% human. 10% um, of our cells are human, 90% are microorganisms. Most are required from the mother, starting during delivery and completed by the age of four. And they're probably of great importance in adult health. We have, for example, in our genome, 25,000 genes. That's all. In our intestine, the study showed in 124 people a total of 3.3 million individual genes. We have a staggering genome in our intestines. And this is another part of genetic inheritance, perhaps. The genes acquired from our mother, not in, in the ovum, but after, after birth. Human genome, 25,000 genes. To put it into perspective, we share half of those almost with a banana. It doesn't leave many more, does it? The microorganisms, the relationship to vitamin D, I don't know. We can only speculate. Uh, but this is really new science, and it's going to mean an awful lot in the future. The microorganisms inhabit our skin, mouth, vagina, and colon. And we know very well there's a relationship between vitamin D and the mouth. We've heard, about, we've heard um, from, from Bill Grant about the mouth and the teeth. Uh, protected by vitamin D, and we've heard also from Bill about the vagina. Inter, um, vaginal dysbiosis is under the influence of vitamin D. So I don't know about the colon yet, but the work shall, I'm sure, develop shortly. So the maternal factor, the maternal factors in, in concerning adult, life, uh, adult health, preconception, gestation, and childhood. And in underpinning these all is vitamin D. So, as, as George Formwood would say, springtime's here again. And spring is the time for conception. Spring conception, summer pregnancy gestation, and an autumn birth. This allows maximal transplacental vitamin D. The baby will use its vitamin D stores during the winter and spring. Uh, we heard from Bruce Hollis earlier that it's only when maternal vitamin D levels are high that the baby can obtain vitamin D from its mother. But most of the time, no vitamin D in milk. And in the first summer, um, the baby will synthesize its own vitamin D. That's the way nature planned it. Late autumn, early winter birth has many advantages. We can see here the variation of vitamin D during the year. We've already seen this data from Elena Hupanen. And we can see the variation here. And we can see the ideal times for conception and birth. Spring conception, autumn birth, allows maximum vitamin D transfer during the late stages of pregnancy. So the baby builds up its stores. This is a Victorian representation of Eastray who was the goddess of fertility. 
And here we're um, running into pre-Christianity. We're dealing with concepts 2,000 years ago. And uh, they understood a little bit about life, which has been forgotten during those 2,000 years. From the name Eastre, we obtain the words estrogen and Easter, which are both linked to fertility. Um, Easter is not a Christian festival, although Christianity uses it. It's pre-Christian. Easter was recognised as a time for conception, and that also goes with that is the Maypole tradition as well. Uh, the advantages follow later. So the prenatal determinants of child and adult health are vitamin D mediated, and they include these. Birth weight, coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, multiple sclerosis and age of menopause. Let's look at some. Vitamin D supplement improves birth weight. And here we see it quite obviously, those on the left with the supplements and those on the right without. And the mothers were having only 400 units a day supplement. Only a small amount, as we've been hearing. I'm looking here at a number of uh, six young adults, adolescents, with low weight for height, each represented by a vertical line, and the vitamin D status of them. Here we can see the ideal range of vitamin D, and we can see that these youngsters were profoundly deficient in vitamin D, and they probably had been since before birth. Maximise vitamin D stores before birth, that's the message. Low birth weight increases adult risk of cardiovascular of, uh, coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular disease, stroke. And here we can see the birth weights um, on the left are the lowest birth weights on the left, column one, and the greatest birth weights on column five. And as the birth weight increases, the adult risk of coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease decreases. Premature birth increases risk also. And this is the quintiles of gestational age. Babies born early have the highest risk of coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular disease as adults. Don't forget, it's during these late stages of, of uh, gestation that the maximum vitamin D stores occur. Weight at one year determines risk of adult coronary heart disease. Again, the, the smaller children, um, the smaller children have got the highest risk, and the heavier children have the lowest risk, quite dramatically so. And also chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Again, weight at one year. The lightest children on the left with the highest risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and those on the right, the heavier children, have a much reduced risk. Adults with COP that I've been seeing recently, again, each one with a vertical line, and we can see very, very low vitamin D levels. They've probably had these since before birth. There's a big but in here, because these studies have started with adults who've died. And if they've died, it means they were born a long time ago. And effectively, the studies have been dealing with these people, people who Lowry defined in Salford and Lancashire. In fact, all these studies have been done in Lancashire because the re health records have been very good and very well preserved. Now, these people who we can see here, they will have been contemporaries of my father who was born in Salford in 1910. And these, these people, born at the early parts of the 20th century, died in the later parts and therefore their birth data was analysed in the studies we've just seen. Now, can we really compare people born in the early 20th century with those born in the early 21st century? Are these three little granddaughters of mine going to have the same disadvantages in respect of health as the people who were my father's generation a century earlier? I think that these little girls will have much better chance in life. So we've got to be a little bit careful about extrapolating from one century to another. But there's some much more up-to-date information. Month of birth determines risk of childhood diabetes. Don't have to look very far in time. And here we can see it. The babies born 
in the spring, three studies in the UK, the babies born in the spring have the highest risk of uh, childhood diabetes. And those born in the autumn have the lowest risk of childhood diabetes. There's a 20% variation. Low birth weight increased the risk of adult diabetes. Once again, this is historic data, but it does show the relationship between, um, between pregnancy features, gestational features, and adult health. Again, birth weight goes up, diabetes risk goes down. And we know that vitamin D improves glucose tolerance. Here we see glucose tolerance curves. At time zero, the blood glucose is measured and the person is given an oral load of, of uh, glucose. The blood glucose levels are measured at one hour and two hours. And the ideal is that the, there's as little variation as possible in the, in the blood glucose level. So the least variation is seen in those with the highest vitamin D levels, those in the dotted yellow line. And the greatest variation, the worst um, glucose tolerance is seen in those with the, with the uh, lowest vitamin D levels in the blue line. Vitamin D is important in diabetes and here we see another group of people with diabetes, adults, and we can see almost uniformly low blood vitamin D levels which they may well have had since before birth. We've seen already about vitamin D supplements and this is Elena Huppenen's work. Um, vitamin D supplements uh, reducing subsequent diabetes in a very, very big way. Tremendous reduction of diabetes risk in, uh, with those taking vitamin D supplements. Metabolic syndrome, low birth weight increases risk as an adult. This again is historic data, but it's of great relevance today. As the birth weight increases, the risk of metabolic syndrome goes down by a factor of four. Metabolic syndrome is this, it's a combination of obesity, fatty liver, diabetes, coronary heart disease and early death. Well, we can start to forget about coronary heart disease, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't be forgetting about early deaths, nor diabetes. I see quite a lot of people with fatty liver, and here's a group of them, quite a lot who come to my outpatient clinic. Uniformly low vitamin D levels, and uh, they could have had these since before they were born. Month of birth also determines risk of multiple sclerosis, like with childhood diabetes. April, May births, maximum incidence, 10% above average at risk of multiple sclerosis. And as we go through the summer, through the vitamin D synthesis months, we find that the risk of multiple sclerosis goes down by, again, 10% below average. Blood level of vitamin D increases risk of, low blood levels of vitamin D increase risk of multiple sclerosis. And here we see it. Very substantial. That the lowest blood levels in column one, the highest blood levels in column five. Diet intake. Those with the lowest diet, vitamin D intake have the highest risk of, vit, of multiple sclerosis. Vitamin D supplement. Again, this is a 400 units a day supplement of vitamin D. Reduces risk of multiple sclerosis by a factor of almost 50%. Staggering to think that the month of birth has an influence on the age of menopause. But here we have it. Girls born in March, April will have the earliest menopause on average. It's only by a factor of a year or a little more than that. And those in September, October, and October will have the latest menopause. It's not of great significance to an individual woman, but it's of great biological importance in respect of thinking about what vitamin D and the sun do to us from an early age into adult life. Um, a late menopause is biologically considered to be a good thing. So we've been looking at the importance of prenatal and childhood factors on adult health. There's one thing that is particularly worrying. Health is getting better for us all, especially now the epidemic of coronary heart disease is over. The pension funds are under pressure. 
there are going to be countless people living to the age of 100. But not those ethnic Asian and black men born in the UK who have worse health than their fathers. And here we see it. First generation in blue. Those are the people who came to this country having been born overseas. Second generation, their, their sons born in this country. And we can see for all these groups, it is the same. The, the sons born in this country have worse health than their fathers. What I want to draw to attention in particular, well, two things. Firstly, it's the Asian and the black Caribbean and African are the same. The only thing in common is skin pigmentation and vitamin D. I'd like to draw attention to the Pakistani and Bangladesh. Major difference. And I think this is due to fish. The Bangladesh people are traditional fish eaters. And even when they live in this country, they eat fish. And I have a Bangladeshi patient who's been in this country 35 years, has an excellent level of, of vitamin D, 35.7, I think it is. And she eats fish from Bangladesh three times a day. Pakistani people do not eat fish. And they also are the ones who go for maximum covering of the skin. So we've got a serious problem, in particular in Pakistani or in boys in this country born to Pakistani mothers. Is this due to inherited vitamin D deficiency? Well, I think so. But if anyone knows an alternative explanation, I'd be very interested to hear it. Let's look at some patients, hospital patients, not a random sample. These people who've come to the hospital, outpatients, two and a half thousand. Each vertical line in blue is an individual person. And we can draw over the vertical line the midpoint of the range. And that cuts off a blood vitamin D level of about 12 nanograms per mil. And we can see 40 as the cutoff for the ideal range. So we've got 50% with, blood, glucose, with um, blood vitamin D levels less than 12. If we look at people with British names, we can see the cutoff point gives us an average level of about 18. But if we look at those with South Asian names, we see the cutoff point for the 50% is about nine. In other words, of the people attending the hospital, here are one and a half thousand, um, 50 per cent of those with South Asian names have blood vitamin D levels less than nine. This is a very serious uh, health, which is really a public health problem when it's on this scale. Vitamin D supplement in pregnancy, I think we're all agreed, yes, it should be given. It should really be given before pregnancy, and there is some evidence that vitamin D does improve fertility. Preconception, it's ideal to maximise sun and uh, sunshine and thereby vitamin D levels. So we have to rely on diet supplements. How much, how given. And I, I recommend to people two or two and a half thousand units per day. If I have to prescribe it, which I do in the hospital, we prescribe the 20,000 units once a week, all by mouth. And here we see the response. The response is reasonable. We see before and after, the blue and the pink. And we can see, um, you, can, you could say, well, why is someone with a blood vitamin D level of 30 receiving a supplement? Well, that was, well, the, the top one was me, because I didn't think 30 was good enough <laughs> as my natural level. There's, some, there's a considerable variation. But there is the genetics of vitamin D metabolism that's important, which you don't really have time to go into. We can see the response is, is reasonable. Compared to intramuscular vitamin D, and this is three months after um, a single injection of vitamin D, uh, 300,000 or 600,000 units. And after three months, there's not a lot of it left. It's helped a bit, but it's not helped, to my mind, enough. So we don't do very much intramuscular vitamin D now. It's nearly all oral. So there we have it. The importance of prenatal and childhood factors on uh, adult health. So much depends on the sun and vitamin D.